Good morning. morning. It's good to be with you this morning. You guys chuckled about uh, me driving the the church bus tonight. You afraid I'm going to get you lost? You ever been lost? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, it's not fun, is it? No, not at all. You know, it's harder these days to get lost than ever before, I think. I mean, everybody's got a cell phone or a GPS. You just pop in where you want to go and push a button and it routes you or reroutes you right to it. So that old joke about, you know, men never stopping and asking for directions. Yeah, they don't tell that joke anymore. Because nobody stops and asks for directions. You just don't need to. Now, if you lost your cell phone, that's a whole different story, isn't it? Yeah, you turn around, you turn things upside down. It's like that parable uh, of the, uh, the lady who loses the gold coin in the house and turns her whole house upside down until she finds it. Lose your cell phone, then call me. Tell me, uh, well, I guess you can't call me. <laughs> you get my point, you know. But, you know, even with all our little gadgets that calculate and recalculate and reroute us to wherever we need to go, uh, life is more lost than ever. Uh, People don't know what news to believe. Uh, They're confused about what bathroom to walk into. We don't don't even know what pronouns we're supposed to use anymore. We are in troubled times. We're uh, we're disoriented. We're anxious. We are lost. And that's exactly where the disciples find themselves in the passage that we're going to read this morning. Uh, it's the night before Jesus is crucified, and they are in the upper room. They're, they're celebrating the Passover feast with Jesus. And Jesus has, has confused them, got them back on their heels a little bit, by going around and washing everyone's feet. You see, that's something that only a servant does. A master doesn't wash your feet. And so their kind of heads are spinning a little bit. And then Jesus drops this on them, and he says, one of them is going to betray him. And they're at a loss to know which one he meant. Even as Judas heads for the door. After he says that, he says that he's leaving them. And where he's going, they can't follow. And Peter, he he objects. He says, I'm going to follow you, Jesus. I'll lay down my life for you. And Jesus tells him, I tell you the truth. Before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. That's the context in which Jesus says these words. John chapter 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord, we give you thanks for your word this morning. We ask that your Holy Spirit would come and bring it to life in us. Lord, I pray that you, you give us ears to hear the truth, that you give us uh, feet to follow the way, and Lord, that you give us hearts that live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I hope you had coffee this morning or whatever it is that gets you awake and alert because uh, we've got not just one I am statement here, we've got three that we've got to talk about. So we're going to... Move quick. Are you ready? Okay. Let's see how we're doing. Okay. Uh, Where does Jesus say he's going? He's going to his father's house. That's right. And what's he going to do there? He's going to prepare a place for his disciples, for us, for everyone who believes in him. He's going to prepare that place for us. Um, And then what is he going to do? He's going to come back and take us to be with him. That's the point. I don't want you to miss that. That's the point. The point isn't the place. The point is to be with him. That's what he says. That's the goal. That's the end game that we can be with him where he is. 
Now, can you think of a time in the Bible or in human history where humanity and God were together in a place and join a relationship? The Garden of Eden. Very good, man. You guys are, ooh, that coffee is doing you good. Yep. The Garden of Eden is the place of peace with God and with one another. The place where love and joy, truth and righteousness rule the day. The place of belonging and prosperity. The place of life. And what happened in Genesis chapter 3? It's the fall. It's when, it's when instead of trusting God's word, humanity believed the lie of the serpent. Disobeyed God and the result was exile out of the garden. It was separation from the giver of life. And it was death. You see, we've been deceived, lost, and dying ever since. We've continued to try to find our way back to that place. Several guides uh, have come along saying that they know the way. And many people have believed them and gone down their trail. And you may even recognize some of, the, some of those ways that, that are being promoted today. They all begin by telling you what's wrong with the world. Here's what's wrong with the world. And then they offer their way of salvation. Yeah. I'll give you one example this morning. Karl Marx came along. He said, here's the problem with the world. Wealth. Too few people control too much wealth, and it oppresses all the other people underneath. What was his way? It's to take from the rich, give to the poor, and then we'll all be equal. There will be prosperity. There will be peace. You know? He divided people by class and set them against each other. Many nations tried and are trying that way without finding the salvation he promised. Now, I could spend all morning giving examples from religions, ideologies, politicians, TV commercials, all who promise to be the way. Do this and your problems are over. Do this and everything's going to be great. Dr. E. Stanley Jones, who was a uh, missionary in the early 20th century, he said it best. He said this, fix in your mind. That no man, no institution, no creed, no denomination, no group, no political party, no ideology, no technology can be invested with saving qualities without disappointment or letdown. All of these have to be saved. In other words, they are all lost. They are all deceived. They are all dying. It's the blind leading the blind. An honest look at, at the history of the world, even our own personal histories, <laughs> will show that all our ways fail at some point. And it leaves us echoing Thomas's question in verse 5. So how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way. Do you know that before Christians were called Christians... They were identified as followers of the way. You see, Jesus is the way to the Father's house. He's the way out of exile, back to Eden, back to a relationship with God where we experience His presence and His fullness. He is the way to the place that God has prepared for us. We call that place heaven. But heaven's not just where you go when you die. No, no. Jesus teaches us what? To pray, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Which means Jesus is the way to heaven on earth, right here, right now. Look, God created the universe to work a certain way. There are physical laws and there are moral, spiritual laws. If we break either set of those laws, we find ourselves troubled, broken, hurt, lost, even dead. <laughs> I can't climb on the roof of the sanctuary and fly off like Superman. The laws of physics don't allow it. And I can't, uh, I can't cheat on my wife and keep my family from suffering. The spiritual, moral laws, they don't work that way. 
You will reap what you sow. And so again, Dr. Jones puts it best, I think. He says, the Christian way is common sense. It's sanity. Anyone who acts differently is a damned fool. And I'm not swearing when I say it. For outside of Christ, we do damn ourselves to futility, to an impossible way of life. We are fools to try it. And you and I both know that he's speaking the truth here because we've experienced it in our own lives, haven't we? When you live with Jesus, the Christian way, the sum total of life is behind you. It's, you're moving in the right flow. You walk as a conqueror. You're afraid of nothing. So when you tell the truth, when you love your neighbor, when you honor your parents, when you respect the property of others, when you stay true to your spouse, when you worship the Lord above everything else, everything within you says this is the natural way to live. This is how it works. But when we don't live with Jesus, when we live another way, you can feel it, the estrangement. You can sense the lights getting dim. You, you're, you're disintegrated. You're out of gear. You feel lost. So that when you lie or steal or cheat on your spouse or envy your neighbor or ignore God, if you harbor bitterness and hatred in your heart, life sags. The music's gone. Everything within you says this is the unnatural way to live. And so Jones sums it up by saying, there isn't a situation on earth for the individual or for society where the Christian thing is not the right thing. So whether it's politics, science, health, marriage, sex, economics, or anything else, Jesus says, I am the way. Jesus claims to be the only way out of exile and back to the Father. Jesus claims to be the way to live life now. Do you believe him? Which way are you going? Jesus also claims to be the truth. <laughs> That'll get him in trouble these days, won't it? The truth, excuse me, sir. You are the truth. You know, you go to, go to university, you go to college, and they'll tell you that there is no absolute truth. All truth is relative, which is an absolute statement. It negates the claim that all truth is relative. But you're at college, so don't let logic get in your way. <laughs> your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. You can believe what you want, but I believe what I will be just, that'll be fine. And we've made each individual now the final arbiter of truth. Unless you're a third party fact checker for Facebook. <laughs> then you get to determine which other people's truths are no longer true. So it's okay to claim to be a truth, but don't you claim you're the truth. But let's stop and think for just a second. Without the truth... Everyone does what is right in their own eyes, and it is chaos and destruction. Without the truth, there is no justice. Without the truth, there's no right and wrong. There's no common morality to live by. Without the truth, there's no reality. Without the truth, we are deceived and have lost our moorings. We have nothing to tie ourselves to as reality just becomes a fog. We're tossed about by every wind and wave that comes along. We are lost. That describes the current state of our culture today. But I got to tell you, this thinking is not new and it's not unique to our culture. This goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. This is the lie that the serpent told Adam and Eve when he said, did God really say? In other words, did God's word, does God's word really determine how the universe is wired to work? Does it determine reality? Does God's word, is God's word the truth? Did God really say? Truth determines reality. Adam and Eve 
believed that if they ate the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would be like God. They would get to determine right and wrong. They could determine their, their own truth, their own reality for themselves. That's the same lie that is played out in our time as people reject the truth and then come up with a truth that they've made up. They believe and they can determine their own reality to live by. <laughs> but it's not how the universe is wired to work. It's a lie. It's not reality. What's reality and how is it determined? John tells us at the beginning of his gospel, chapter 1, he says this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. A few verses later, he says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Paul writes about Jesus in Colossians chapter one. He says, for by him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him, all things hold together. Jesus determines reality. He created it. He says, I am the truth. Jesus here, he's reversing the lie in the garden. You know, almost every time Jesus opens his mouth in the gospel, he begins a sentence with, I tell you the truth. Over and over again. That's what Jesus is doing. He's trying to get through to us. I tell you the truth. Tell you the truth over and over. He is the end of the deception that causes us to trust in created things rather than the creator. He is the one who is our anchor in the midst of the storm. He is the reality upon which the universe was created and is governed. I am the truth. Do you believe him? And Jesus says, I am the life. I am the life. Can you imagine a world without death? Without pain, without suffering? See, that's how God created it to be in the beginning. It was a place without any of that. But Adam and Eve chose to believe the lie and disobey God. We call that moment the fall. And the results were catastrophic. They were exiled from the garden. They were separated from God, each other, themselves even. And they died spiritually. And they began to die physically as well. And sin still works the same today. It always causes separation or exile from God, from each other, even from ourselves. It always brings disintegration with all of creation. And it always ends in death. Always. The old saying is right. You cannot sin successfully. Death came into the world when humanity sinned. It's the result of the fall. But Jesus came into the world to defeat sin and death. He is the life that humanity was created to live. He is the life with no sin. All love, all grace, obedient to God in every way, even obedient to death on the cross. His perfect life paid the penalty for our sin so that we could be forgiven and come back from exile so that we could come home. Home to the place that Jesus has prepared for us. Like the Garden of Eden. John gives us a, a glimpse of what that looks like. In Revelation 21, he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, 
Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. That's the place that Jesus is preparing for us right now. You might, and if you ask, how can you know the way? Jesus answers, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do you trust him? You know, a lot of people, even some who call themselves Christians, they don't like this I am statement of Jesus. They don't believe it. They say it's too exclusive. They believe that a, a loving God would provide more than one way. There's lots of ways to God. The, the truth is God doesn't have to provide any way, does he? No. The fact that God provided one way at great cost to himself when he didn't have to demonstrates how loving he is. And have you seen any other way get people back home? You know, this statement, it bugs people on a number of levels. I think because they don't want to hear that they're lost, that they're deceived, that they're dying. But that's what we are. The world still wants to believe the lie the devil's been selling since Genesis chapter 3. That we can be like God. That we can determine truth. We can follow our own way. That we can save our own life. So we hang on. We hang on to our ideologies, our isms, our idols, all of them that promise salvation. But how's that working out for you? Just look around at the condition of the world. Every departure from Jesus, both individually and as a society, in thought, word, or deed, leaves us lost, deceived, and dying. Reminds me of a tourist that got lost on a safari in Africa. He wandered off from the group and found himself in unfamiliar territory. There were no roads, there were no paths, there was nothing to follow. And so he just kept heading off in different directions, trying to find his way back. And it started to grow dark and he got afraid. He thought he might not see another sunrise. And the more he got nervous, uh, the darker it got until he encountered a native. And he told the man he was lost, he didn't know how to get home. So the na native, he said, follow me and began to cut right through the jungle. They weren't following a road. There was no path. And so after a while, the lost man said, are you sure we're going the right way? I can relate to that. And the native replied, there is no way. I am the way. Trust me. Sure enough, they came through the jungle and the man was reunited with his group. But folks, that's us. That's us. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see what Jesus is doing? Jesus is reversing the fall in Genesis chapter 3. He's flipping it all back to the right. That's what he's doing. He's providing the way home. The world was made to be our home. It was, it was made for us to dwell with God. But because we believe the lie, we were exiled from that place. And we're lost and dying as we search for the way back home. But hear this good news. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. That whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus left his place in heaven to come search, come search for us. He was rejected. He was abandoned by everyone. He took on our sin, died on the cross, and was raised to life so that he could bring us home. And he tells each and every one of us 
Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may be where I am. You know the way to the place I am going. Do you believe him? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful that you came, that you came looking for us. We confess that we are lost, that we've, we're deceived, and we're dying. All of our own making. And yet you love us so much that you took on our death to give us life. And so, Lord, come. We open our lives up to you. Lead us in the way home. Tell us the truth. And give us your life. You're the giver of all life. Forgive our sin. Forgive us for wandering off to do our own thing. Forgive us for the devastation that that's caused. But bring us to the place that you've prepared for us. Thank you for your mercy and your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.